Time Magazine ran a story recently about 2024 being the biggest year ever for elections around the world. It's not just an election year for us, it's an election year for people in 64 countries. The European Union is having an election too, so when you put all that together, it means 49% of the world is electing their national leader this year. Which naturally causes most of the world to ask, what's going to happen? I have a friend who has a, a go-to phrase that she uses for questions like, what's going to happen now? It's the way she stays grounded. The phrase is, well, more will be revealed. That's what she says to herself whenever there's a biopsy that has results that haven't come in yet. Well, more will be revealed. When it's a new year, when it's election time, more will be revealed. One of the things that we have to acknowledge is that there is always this division between two things that feel true to us at the same time. One thing that feels true is there's kind of nothing new under the sun. Everything just repeats on a cycle. History's kind of just repeating itself. But on the other hand, there's evidence that every day is a new and unrepeatable gift that we get that has gifts just for right now and just for today. We know that these two things have evidence for both being true. Everything's on a cycle and there's nothing new under the sun and there's total newness and freshness in every single day that we face. Well, one thing that plays into this that we have to acknowledge is that we know we can change the course of our story anytime we want because we know we have free will. We can make a choice for good or bad any day we want to do something that changes our story in a significant way. Humans have free will and so does God. God can do whatever God wants at any point. So that means, although it is sometimes tempting to feel like nothing ever changes, it's always going to be this way, you can't fight City Hall or whatever other things fall under that umbrella, although that gets real tempting for us, we know that there is always an opportunity for something to happen that changes up the way things have always been. Jesus' birth proves that. His birth shows us that sometimes God acts in a way that changes the whole experience of how we connect with our own lives and with God. Jesus' birth was an interruption to the way things always were. And that's why we refer to this feast as the epiphany. Seeing something we'd never seen before. Understanding God in a whole new way. And it required openness in order for people to see it. The Magi are a very interesting group because they had no skin in the game at all. They weren't from the Jewish religion and they weren't from the land of Jesus. They were foreigners. They were not religious in the way that Jesus was. And we know from some evidence that they were scientists of sorts, astronomers, people who depended on the natural world to reveal to them what the truth was about life. And so what's really interesting about this part of Jesus' birth story is that the religious people were put at a disadvantage over the ones who weren't so religious. A lot of us here today would probably say that we fall under the category of pretty religious. That might not be true for you. You might say, I don't know about that, Father. I'm more of a seeker, and I can understand that. 
But I bet there's a lot of people here that if you were asked, are you religious, you would say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty religious. And this is one of those times that we see that being pretty religious does have its challenges when God does something unexpected. Because the religious people couldn't buy this. Most of them anyway. They would have bought it if he were born in the temple in Jerusalem. They would have thought that was appropriate. If the Messiah were born in the Holy of Holies, they would say, yeah, that makes sense. If he were born in the Roman Forum and there were trumpets blasting at the time of his birth, they would have thought, yeah, yeah, that seems appropriate. But a barn? No. The Magi, though, were not limited by any preconceived notions of how God might work. They were completely open to just letting God lead them wherever that would be. It shows us that while there are many wonderful things about keeping our religious faith near and dear to our heart, one challenge for us is to ask if we're really staying open to God doing something unexpected, changing the story, taking things in a new direction. A woman told me a story that's kind of famous in her family. It's about her little brother who's now grown. But this this has kind of been a touchstone story for the family over the years. It's about when her brother was three years old and their mother was trying to introduce him to chicken a la king. I don't know how many of you grew up with casseroles as a big part of your life. I know I did. And I would say that chicken a la king night was one of the better nights. We enjoyed that. The only downside was there were no Pillsbury Crescent Rolls involved in the pan. But but it's a good dish. And I think a lot of us who've grown up with casseroles would say, yeah, chicken a la king. And the mom knew this would be a hard sell for her little boy because he liked chicken, but he only liked it on a drumstick. And he liked gravy, but only if it was on mashed potatoes. And she couldn't convince him that he liked vegetables. So she just kind of hid them in there. And he wasn't having it. He would not open his mouth for this. And she said, sweetheart, try it. It's filled with things that you like eating. Try it. You'll like it. And he said, but I don't want to like it, mommy. And that's something that we can maybe recognize in ourselves, too. I don't want all this newfangled stuff. I think a lot of us feel that way when someone younger than we are comes to us and says, try this app or you've got, no, I don't want any of that. No, I don't want to like it. So we're in a position to ask ourselves if we've gotten pretty far down the road of I don't want to like it, is there still a little bit in us of the, well, more will be revealed. Do we still have that aspect of our lives? Because we know that Herod didn't want to like it. And a lot of the religious leaders didn't want to like it. But the Magi said, huh, more will be revealed. Whenever we don't want to accept a change to the way things have always been, we run the risk of falling in that trap. And when we do we may wind up getting embarrassed. 1,500 years after the Magi taught us to keep an open mind in terms of what God can do in the world, we had another opportunity to face that same kind of lesson. It was when the astronomer Galileo Galilei realized that the sun seemed to be the center of everything, not the earth. We had always believed it was the earth. We thought it was essential that it was the earth. But he looked through his telescope and said, no, friends, what I'm seeing is the earth is what moves. The sun stays still. We could not handle that at all. That was off the table of possibilities. We condemned him. We put him under house arrest. We couldn't listen to that. And he, he died never having been exonerated. In fact, although that happened hundreds of years ago, it was not until I was a junior in high school, 1992, that Pope St. John Paul II said, 
We're sorry, Galileo. You were right. When we're not open to more being revealed, we can get really dug in to the way things have always been. So on this Epiphany Day, may we experience some openness in our relationship with God. May we learn to hold fast to the things that are foundational about our faith, but not get stuck into not wanting to like God being able to do something new. Because Christmas showed us, in a very real way, a lesson that we have to remember throughout all the years of our life. Well, more will be revealed. <laughs>